Filing past his remains. Just a couple of minutes ago, uh, the uh, former president John Dramani Mahama uh, came uh, to pay his last respects. Before that was the vice president Mahmoud Baumia who also filed past. And now the speaker of parliament um, is just taking his steps together with um, other dignitaries. Leader, the minority leader himself is part of it, and uh, other senior. Uh, members of the parliamentary service have joined the speaker to pay their last respects to the honorable uh, lawyer John Akwaribu in Debo Green. So as he does the filing past, the tribute from the Parliament of Ghana is also being read. But I'm not doing this alone. I'm here with my colleague, Umar Sanda Amadou, who uh, throughout his life as a journalist, uh, probably one of the people he interviewed the most, I mean, and it was always interesting speaking to uh, lawyer Akpari Bundebu. Sanda, welcome. Thank you, Duke. Um, I must say it's a day that we should be sad, but it's also a day that we should be happy that we are celebrating an individual whose life has been a very interesting one. Um, how do I even put it? Ndebogri is a guy who swims against the tide. I mean, when everybody is swimming to the left, John Akwaribu Ndebogri is a guy who starts swimming to the right. And you ask him why, and he has a very, very cogent reason to, to, to put forth. I first encountered Ndebogri when I was producing The Big Issue. Um, at the time, Shamima was the host of uh, The Big Issue on Saturdays, and subsequently Richard Sky, Patrick Ayumu, and all those people. And there's this guy uh, who would always come in, and when the whole argument is going this way, he is going that way, and that is John Akwaribu Ndebogri. I had no him before starting journalism. I remember when he resigned and said he had joined the NPP. This is someone who was working with Rawlings. This is someone who was part of the PNDC. He was PNDC secretary for the upper region, which means he was Rawlings' representative in the upper east region. And his deputy at the time, Martin Alamisi Benz Kaiser Amido. And these are two people who have similar characteristics and traits, and we'll be developing and exploring them later. Now, he decides, having been an MP in Parliament on the ticket of the People's National Convention, PNC, to quit and join the NPP. It was a big deal, but he did it anyway. That's in Debo Gray for you. Now, I had been following his news, and he always looked very vociferous, a very, you know, he, he always had a way of fighting and making his point clear. So when I started producing the big issue, one of the regular panelists we had on the on the big issue, he was always there. And I remember when I met him in the Supreme Court one day, a lawyer referred to him as Ghana's longest lawyer. And and he's essentially tall, a very tall man, a very, very tall man. And so the lawyer said, Ghana's longest lawyer. And I said, oh, that's actually what you are. And he said, yeah, he's long in many ways and it's even complicated and long. I was at lectures um, that Friday evening when I received the information that Debugri was dead. I was shocked and the rest of my lecture I, I couldn't make sense of what was happening. Like I just developed this very heavy head headache and it was really difficult for me because Debugri is someone I had grown to become a son of. I call him up for advice, I speak to him on a number of issues. Off record, as in off air, there are so many things that he and I discuss in private. I have been to his house to visit him. I had actually gone to Boku to perform an assignment for him before. And, and, and this is an assignment. And I mean, now that he's gone, and since I have told his sons, I think it's only fair that I can mention it here. So, John Debury called me up one day and said, um, you know what, I want to get married. I'm like, on one day, you already have two wives, or is it a wife and two wives, and you already have plenty of children, why do you have to get married again? He said, no, I think you Fulani people are very handsome and beautiful, so I have found this Fulani sister of yours, and I want to marry her. I said, Nde, are you serious? He said, yes. I said, where's the lady? He said, she's in Boku. But there's a little problem, so I want you to deal with it for me. I said, what is the problem? He said, the lady's father said, she will not let the marriage happen until I until I, I become a Muslim, until I convert. I said, okay, do you want to convert? He said, no, 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 I'm not going to convert. So you try and talk to the father for me. 
or call your father and tell your father to talk to her father for me. I'm like, why are you putting me in this difficulty? So, I mean, my father is in the village. I didn't bother. Then I was traveling up north for my own personal stuff. Then he told me to make sure I reach Boko and find Bolga and meet the lady and talk to her. So I went to Bolga and I met this lady and I spoke to her. She's a Fulani and everything. I said, okay. So what happens? He said, your uncle is such a difficult man. We have agreed to get married. All he needs to do is to convert and become a Muslim. To come with I think the solution is simple. Just become a Muslim. He said, tomorrow. I have lived my whole life. Why am I going to convert now to die a confused man? I have, I have chosen my religion. I have decided what I want to be. If that's the reason, then the marriage is not going to happen. And that's how that marriage failed to happen. And it's very interesting because they will always come up with all manner of crazy ideas. Even his death is rugged with or dog with controversy. He has told very close associates that he's packing bag and baggage and leaving a crap because he's going to die. This is what he told very close associates and friends that he's traveling up north. He's going back and he will not come again. So he packed out. Ah, in there, what is the matter? He left. So he stopped everything he was doing here in Accra and went up there. And according to his son, who has gone to his bedroom after his death, he had arranged all his books. You know how someone arranges their stuff when they are traveling? That's how he arranged his stuff in his room before he left. So he arranged his books. He put his money in envelopes and packed them aside. <clears throat> he, he sort of packed everything in readiness to die. Then he goes to ask that they should lay his mat under a tree. There's a big tree in his house in Zebila, um, and, um, the, the village, not Zebila Township, but the main village where he comes from. So he said that they should lay a mat under the tree for him. So he goes to lay down. You know, that's where he usually sits with his radio set listening to eyewitness news from Accra. And he'll be sending messages or calling me and fighting me over something I may have said or not. Then he, and he just died there. He said they should call the doctor for him, and by the time the doctor came, he was gone. And there are many people who said that Inde really predicted death. And, and that story, if I hadn't heard it from very close family members, and very, I wouldn't believe it. Like, it doesn't sound any believable, but that is in the book. So it's been controversial from birth to death. And this is someone who was in Nigeria doing his own thing, and for a whole jet to be taken to Nigeria to, to, to bring him to be a minister under Rollins, and he falls out with Rollins. I mean, who does that? I mean, when, when you hear him speak about Rollins, the kind of things he said to me about Rollins, and this was before Rollins died. And I said, Indeed, you need to write a book. You need to tell us about the PNDC. You need to tell us about the AFRC. All those things. You need. He was PNDC Secretary for Apais. He became PNDC Secretary for Agriculture. And then he was transferred to Volta Region, to be PNDC Secretary for Volta Region. And he was always doing his own things. I mean, always fighting and always ensuring that things are done. And if you listen to the, the tributes that were read on his behalf or for him uh, in Parliament House yesterday from persons like Cletus Apula Voka, the man he removed from Parliament who came back to remove him in Zebila, and you hear from so many other people, you are like, wow, this man is really a difficult man. And not, not, a, not a difficult man in that sense, but when he is convinced about something, he, he, would, he would push that hard. And I'm sure we'll be talking more about Ndi, the man, but I think we can listen to some of the tributes and come back and talk more. Yeah. So for now, the uh, deputy clerk, charge of legislative management, uh, Jetro, Mr. Homa Jetro, uh, lawyer Homa Jetro, is delivering parliament's tribute. Uh, to John Ndebugui. Let's take you live to the podium where that tribute is happening now. To excellence and higher learning, corroborating in one of his beliefs that no matter how full the river, it still wants to grow. As a product of the Kwame Kwame University of Science and Technology, he proceeded to his Bachelor of Laws at the where he would eventually become one of the legal luminaries of the country. His determination devotion to duty and the strength of his conviction set him apart and it is it is why we are proud to share memories of a life well lived 
the fundamental trust bits where education centered, always reiterating the importance of capital investment by the government into education, especially in the private community. As a lawyer, in his background, he advocated the importance of legal education and science. On the 26th of January 2006, he debated spiritedly. Mr. Speaker, as the honorable colleague who has just spoken has said, technology is practicalization of science. Therefore, for us to benefit from science and to benefit from technology, there must be a solid link between science and technology. Still on education, he was one of the firm advocates for distance education in Ghana, especially for people in rural areas to assess adequate educational opportunities. In his contribution to the government's financial policy, 2006, on the 16th of November 2005, he stated, I think that we need to improve upon the distance education system still because the more we encourage some of these traditionally trained teachers to go into the tertiary levels and improve upon their knowledge and their skills, the better they will perform in the field. The late Ndebugri was a legislator who had mastery over the rules, procedures, and workings of parliament. As a selfless patriot, he was always generous with all the knowledge he had accumulated and contributed so much to the literature of parliament. He was a mentor to many young and old lawyers and politicians who have emerged on the political scene in Ghana. For his loss, for the loss of such a devout public servant, parliament and the nation Ghana are the poorer. While words can never fully express how much we feel about his passing, we are grateful to the Lord that he, was, he has contributed his quota to the dutiful task of nation building. And we know that God will reward him for his meritorious service unto humanity, for families, friends, and loved ones whom he has left behind. His death is a reminder to all of us that our lives are finite, a reminder to live fully today because everybody will undergo the sentence of the grave. Honorable John Ndebugri has de played his part admirably, and it behoves of us to also play our parts with perseverance and hard work. Late Honorable Ndebugri, may your peace, loving soul, and the souls of all the faithful departed rest in peace and rise in glory on the resurrection day. I thank you. We're grateful to the Parliament of Ghana for that warm tribute. Joining us this morning, we're pleased to have the Chief Justice of the Republic, His Lordship Justice Enini Boa, in the company of His Lordship Justice Duche and His Lordship Justice Bafo Boni. We shall now receive the children and the widow as they pay tribute to their late husband and father. While at that, we urge all the officers to please move to the back and obtain sachets of water for all our guests.
President of the Republic of Ghana. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament, His Lordship, the Chief Justice and Justices of the Supreme Court, Your Excellency, former President of the Republic of Ghana, Chief of Staff, Ministers of State, Members of Parliament, Distinguished Members of the Bench and Bar, you early in the morning, assuring you of her immediate return to Zebula if she got clearance from her doctors, whom she was scheduled to consult later that same day in Accra. You sounded very upbeat and instructed her to tell us, quote, bring my wife back in one piece, unquote. Little did she know that, after 51 odd years of knowing and subsequently getting married to you, that brief conversation was the very last I left the hospital. Our respective phones kept buzzing unusually from family members back home. The news of your sudden ailment was frantically shared with us. The doctor immediately called. Unfortunately, the collective industry of the health experts yielded to the desire of America to be seated with him at this time. We, collectively, hoped for a better outcome. Sadly, our hopes soon turned into anguish despondency and dejection as your doctor willed uncontrollably in an undiscernible audible I'm sorry we lost him unquote our lives were immensely sh immediately shattered we wept and willed in our futile attempts to in the words of Shakespeare quote make less the depth of grief unquote together with many other citizens of our country our hearts are broken, our lights are burned, and our pain is piercing. But we are encouraged by the spirit of attitude and fertility in the face of despair as we do in war. You were a great father without a doubt. For the rest of the country, you were a great, the no nonsense, great politician and astrologer. Even though you were so marvelous attributes to us, you were just daddy. At an early age, you made us realize that as children from a poverty ridden background, the greatest equalizer enabling us to compete effectively and equally was none other than education. You challenged each of us not to Take pride in your heritage. Be the head and not the tail. Resist any attempts at suppression with all you have. I have nothing to leave for you besides making sure you get the best education you possibly can. I'm grateful for your love, care, attention, and detailed involvement in putting together the scenes of the beautiful mosaic of what each of us has become today. So passionate was your love for education that, at an early age, you made sure we all had a copy of the book code First Aid in English. You would come from work and ask that we go through synonyms 
antonyms, similes, past and present tenses of verbs, superlatives, and so on and so forth. You were an avid reader, voraciously reading anything you chanced upon to expand your knowledge in all disciplines. You encourage us to develop the failure to read and building on knowledge was a choice way to meet the tail, tail in the head. In math, as a scientist, you took exceptional interest in encouraging us to develop an equally interest in that discipline. Unfortunately, besides your only daughter, the rest of us had little interest in math or science. Nonetheless, today, excellence in our respective disciplines is a direct derivative of all the years of hard work you put into building a strong and solid foundation for us to confront the unforgiving challenges characterizing today's global marketplace. Even though that's, death seems to have created a gulf between us, borrowing the words of Gandhi and Helen Keller respectively, quote, there are no goodbyes for us. Wherever you are, we will always be with you, unquote. Quote, for what we have enjoyed and deeply loved, we can never lose. For all that we love deeply becomes a part of us, unquote. All you truly wanted to build and raise was a family capable of independently living outside your shadows. Daddy, you have truly excelled in your quest to create an indivisible quartet, steeped in like ideology, independent of the nucleus. All four of us, Pat, myself, Thomas, and Nelson, will not relent in our efforts to project the principles you so dearly held to your human existence. Those giant full trains will definitely not be filled. But our collective will to surmount all the challenges will see us through. Like you, we will also follow in like manner in bringing up your grandchildren in much the same way you raised us. Although eternally bonded in spirit, we will truly miss those fiscal encounters and discussions of family matters, local politics, national politics, legal issues as it related to me. You were always open to counter opinions and suggestions without necessarily diminishing the weight of the counter proposition. You would have tense arguments and discussions on the need to straddle the lane in your public commentaries on topical national issues. Times without number, you would always say, quote, this is why we sacrifice for a free democratic state. If anyone has a counter opinion, it is their choice to freely express it, unquote. You embody the true spirit of nationalism as aptly captured in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Quote, May I stress the need for courageous, intelligent, and dedicated leadership. Leaders of sound integrity, leaders who are not in love with publicity, but in love with justice. Leaders who are not in love with money, but in love with humanity. Leaders who can subject their particular egos to the greatness of the cause, unquote. You were unimpressed and consistently unseduced by materialism. Unismayed by adversity, Whenever you were, whenever you had a deep conviction in what was fair and just in you, you never failed to remind us that, quote, there's a lot more to life than grapes, mortar, and cars, unquote. You prefer to live in relative poverty with unimpeachable dignity and good conscience. Daddy, you encourage us to remain modest in our lifestyles while putting our dignity and human conscience at the pinnacle of our aspirations. As your life has been lying before us at the forefront of the State House today, these principles and ideologies you stood for have become manifestly appreciated and recognized since your demise. Without a doubt, we are emotionally debilitated by the grief. However, our spirits are lifted by the overwhelming outpouring of love, admiration, and recognition of what you contributed in making Ghana a better place as envisioned by her founders. You were so incorruptible, so uncompromising with what you believed was the truth, so unapologetically obdurate to many issues on social justice and reform, and jealously steadfast in your conviction to what you believed was right. Daddy never surrounded his conviction for, for political expediency or favor. At no stage in your life were you ever timorous. You openly and freely expressed your views, damning the consequences if you believed you were right. On countless occasions, you spoke truth to power, believing it was your constitutional right and civic duty to be the voice of the silent majority. In death, you will never be remembered as a wealthy man who once lived.
What we know for sure is that you will forever be remembered as a true statesman who mirrors the image of honor, dignity, love for country, and an unrepentant crusader for justice for all. In politics, you distinguish yourself by consistently seeking to make better the interests of the masses with no regard for personal gain. You built your political life on the foundations of socialism, seeking the utilitarian good above individual benefit or personal interest. You embody the words of Dr. Kane when he said, quote, we are tied in a single garment of destiny. We are caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, unquote. Realizing our perfectly perfect, our perfectly imperfect attempts to attain the greater benefits to society, you often went, a grain, went against the grain of mainstream politics, usually isolated and having little reservoir of support amongst your colleagues. You persevered in whatever course you thought was just. You succeeded in many of those pursuits as you equally lost as many. In the end, for you, each of those battles was a victory in your eyes. The true failure being a failure to act on what you thought was right. You despise greed, corruption, and any form of self-serving disposition in our body politics. At our much younger ages as your children, we often ignorantly question your disinterest in creating a more comfortable living environment for the family when you evidently have the capacity to do so. With age, we have grown wiser and have come to understand that the beauty of politics and life of a politician is not that which he creates for himself. Rather, the pursuit of hope for the majority triumph over cynicism is what truly matters in a real man's life. You walk your talk boldly and uprightly, challenging authorities throughout the, all facets of your life because you knew no one had anything on you. Your demise today truly marks the passing away of the finest and very few, of one of the finest and very few egalitarians this country will ever know. We are truly proud to have called you our father. You were a blessing to us, to the Kusasi Kingdom, to Northern Ghana, and to Ghana at large. While we celebrate you today in an era of democratic constitutional governance, we are reminded of the valiant sacrifices you, together with a few other fallen souls of your generation, and a few others still alive, have contributed to the constitutional dispensation we enjoy today. For us as your children, each day the frontiers of, the demo of our democracy are pushed further by the recognition of the fundamental tenets of justice, free speech, and all other indicia of rule of law. We will proudly look up to the heavens and say with great pride that John Ndebugwe, our father, daddy, was one of the architects of Ghana in the Fourth Republic. As we welcome and embrace several politicians who are present here today to pay their last respects, we are hopeful that their collective appreciation of you and other progenitors of, your, of the longest sur uh, surviving democratic reign in Ghana would inspire a new sense of political culture to become the politician of yesteryear like you. A few more great men like your ilk in our country will certainly see the Ghana with so much desire to come. To be and now, dearly beloved, let's rise and acknowledge the of the President of our Republic, Nana Adamara.
to feel immeasurable dejection and sorrow with your passing away. We are somewhat consoled by the words of George Quote, it is foolish to mourn great men who died. Rather, we should thank God that such men lived. You were indeed a great man by the truest definition of that statement. That commanding presence of your six foot four frame inch will be missed. That exceptional intelligence and charisma will never be replaced. That honesty, courage, and bravery to stand by your principles will never be forgotten. That rare sense of modesty and respect for human life, dignity, and justice for all will forever remain a part of your legacy. Generations yet unborn would read and hear about what you stood for with so much hope that a few men like you will certainly make the world a better place. You have been a true warrior for what is always right. Like Dr. Nkrumah, such men never die you have only been extinguished in flesh. But your legacy will forever inspire us, your children, grandchildren, and generations of indebigrates to come. We will weep less and celebrate your astounding accomplishments in your 72 years of life gifted to us by your maker. We will love you, Daddy. Rest well. Smile down on us from the heavens, knowing that you raised exceptionally responsible children to take over from where you left off. Your race is run. It is time to rest now. Pam, so. The widow and it's read by Rebecca Zuma Asumda. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Revelation 14, 13. I met John, as I affectionately call him, in the year 1969 through my brother, Akia Agbango at the Boku where students get together. We exchanged pleasantries that night. The following day, John followed up to my house and expressed his love to me. I was a bit skeptical about his attraction towards me since we were apart. John at that time was in the sixth form, and I, a young girl, not in school, the thought of his affection for me seemed unreal and far-fetched. Despite my doubts and fears, it wasn't. Before long, I was married to John in the year 1971. John getting my father's consent to marry me was even more difficult than his persuasion to have me agree to marry him. My late father his, had his preference for a local man who was seemingly established as a merchant and a well-to-do by local standards. Against all persuasions, I defied my family and 
with John. Often, my father would chase me out of the house and make threats of this old I loved John for who he was. At that early age of nine, I was quick to realize how different he was, never doubting that my poor village boyfriend had the right future ahead of him. I didn't need much to be convinced that greatness was upon him. My journey with, with him was not rosy at the beginning. To make ends meet, a dependent student on his mother, a farmer kumdawadawa seller, a well, as well as his older brother who was also a farmer, barely had much to take care of himself. Realizing as an apprentice mistress, I quickly learned the vocation and soon graduated ahead of time to own my own shop. I worked tirelessly to support myself and John while he was in school. This throughout his latter years in sixth form and throughout his university days at KNUST. John never stopped assuring me, Sophia, I promise to take good care of you when I complete school. True to his word, when his feet were planted after graduating from school, he never reneged on those promises. He took exceptional care of the children and I threw his life after school. John's love for me was so between us. Five years married with no child, John brushed aside relentless family pressure to seek another woman for children. We eventually had our first daughter in March 1976. My marriage for me, my marriage to John will always be my greatest accomplishment in life. He taught me a whole lot how to carry myself in public as a lady, how to eat at the table, and how to speak English, and much more. He performed his fatherly role very well. He was so much dedicated to me and the children. He loved his children so much that he did education for anything else. At their younger ages, he never missed their birthdays, always spoiling them with gifts and throwing birthday parties, however small. He was such a straightforward man. He never missed his words. He stood for truth and would always say things as they were. He had our own, we had our own challenges along the line, but through it all, the love we had for each other pulled us through. John, in your last days, you were overcaring and protective of me. Your love for me was so strong. You pumped me like a baby. Little did I know that it was your way of saying goodbye to me. Yet, May 22 was the last day of being with you. You came out of the room to say goodbye to me when patients were taking me to Accra for a medical checkup. You spoke the next day. We spoke the next day, Thursday. You did not complain of any headache or pain in any part of your body. The morning of the day you finally left us, we spoke again. You were rather worried about my quickly returned after consulting with my doctors. You sounded very well. A few hours later, my heart was broken. When the news of your sudden demise started trickling, I never had the chance to say goodbye, to share the last 51 years we've been together, to hold, kiss you, assuring you I would follow you wherever you were. You are a giant man. A true human to have been blessed. I am drowned in tears. I am lost in thoughts. The star of Kusa has fallen. The great warrior of Kusa has fallen. My dependent partner, my brother, my friend, and my father has left me feeling lonely and filled with grief. Rest in peace, and I love. to the children and the widows. Who became a revolutionary and named his children Vlad, Nelson, and Thomas. I had a lot of patience and patience. 
because he was married to Sophia, a woman of divine wisdom. The legacy. Dearly beloved, we bring this burial service to a close as we receive to far past last together with the family of our late father of clergy. While they are that, we shall dedicate this hymn to the family, Heavenly Love Abiding. seen him on our television screens and heard him on our radio set as uh, we celebrate his life today he has passed on to glory and is going to be laid to rest in his village in the Zibila district constituency of the Upper East region his family members are filing past now and you've seen his sons there uh, Vlad uh, Vladimir of course as you know a revolutionary name Nelson Mandela, Nelson, that's the, the guy in the middle with the glasses, and Thomas, uh, from Thomas Sankara. Uh, these are three powerful names, and of course, Patience, his daughter. Uh, these are the four, the quartet that he has left behind. John Akwaribo Ndebugri, the man who has been controversial. Uh, you can call it from birth to death. His life been celebrated today, and is the final part of the pre-burial ceremony and activities happening here at the state house at the forecourt of the state house in accra a place that honorable ndebugri knows very well or knew very well. um the people's national convention where he has he been representing before he lost the seat back to uh, his brother and comrade General uh, Apul Avoka, Cletus Apul Avoka, who uh, was MP for this particular constituency, the uh, Zebila constituency. So, this is the uh, final f f rites that have been performed here. He would, his body will be conveyed to uh, Zebila for the burial service, which is going to happen. His sons are here with um, the other members of the family, members of parliament heavily represented here. Indeed, the president of the land who was in parliament with Ndebugri is here at the time. Ibuakwa South MP, Ndebugri being MP for Zebila, they were in the house of parliament together. The former president, John Dramani Mahama, was in parliament with uh, Ndebugri, is here, former president of the land was MP then for Bole. The Vice President, Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia, uh, knows and worked with uh, Ndebogri very well, also here um, to mourn with him. The Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumanakins for the Bagbin, from then the Nadoli constituency, also here uh, to mourn with uh, the family. The Minister for the Interior, Ambrose Derry, uh, is here, that was from the Upper West Region, a neighboring constituency. Don't forget, Ndebugri was once a regional secretary for the Upper East Region under PNDC. And uh, 
lots of other uh, key persons who are going to be here. The Chief Justice, Kwesini uh, Yeboa, is here um, also uh, to mourn with the family. and It's a celebration of life of a man who has I'm lived nice. his life so, so well. I'm going to try and uh, May I invite all of us to engage please stand. a few people. I'm going to speak to a few people who have uh, known and worked with John Ndebogri in the past uh, to see if um, what he remembers of uh, the Honorable John Ndebogri, members of parliament from the Upper East region where his home region is. Um, someone you're seeing in your shot now, Cletus Avoka is a man who used to do a rat race with him, uh, with uh, Nobu Ndebugri when he was member of parliament. I think um, on this day, it's fair to approach you and just uh, ask you to say a word or two about to Ndebugri. viewers about your brother Ndebugri, yes, Ndebugri. who has passed on. Yes. You and him are brothers, even though you were political rivals, you were also brothers. How, what do you remember about Ndebugri? Yes. We, we, we had become political rivals, but we were more uh, inner to ourselves than the, the politics that would divide us. I grew up in Debogri, the same middle school. We went past common entrance together in Abrongo Secondary School. Nde was a pace setter, very brilliant uh, throughout his career. In, in the Zebula, he was the only for one student who were allowed to ride the common entrance, and he passed. In the Vrogo Sasko 1970, he set the first record of getting five ones. And then the, when we were in sixth form, we went on strike together. He was adjured to be a ringleader, unfortunately. You were students and you went on strike? Yes, we were, we were, we were from one together up to he, sixth form. He inspired that to strike, yes. didn't he? Yeah, as a result of that strike, I was suspended for one year. I didn't do lower six. I just came back to upper six. He was dismissed. From school? Yes. In, uh, then uh, because of his good O levels, he went to Cape Coast University to do the prelims for one year. That time he could do one year prelims as an advanced student and then uh, qualify to university. But while he was there, he didn't want to continue in Cape Coast. So he wrote the A level privately in 1972 and passed and went to Tech. That's when he came to KNUST? Yeah, KNUST. Chemical chem 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 engineering uh, at that time. But we, we had kept faith with each other. We had been together like one mother's children. All this while, he didn't want to be a lawyer, but all this while, no. He used to frown upon law yeah. that we were liars, uh, we were people who were cheating the society. The Speaker of Parliament said he, yes. he described him as a petty bourgeois. A petty bourgeoisie, <laughs> and that was obtained. Yeah, he didn't want to. Then, um, uh, when we left school, he went to Nigeria briefly and then came back. He was a stalwart in the Kosasi struggle for independence and liberation. We were very instrumental, and then that is how we got our independence. We regained our independence because the struggle started with Asunda and Ko in the First Republic. Yeah. So, when politics came, he went to PNC, I went to the NDC. That was when PN, uh, national, uh, I went to NDC, National Democratic Congress, but he went to People's National Convention. That was led by Dr. Hile Liman. Um, we contested each other in Zebula. I used to win uh, since 1992. He won in 2004 and came to Parliament. But after one time, they, they brought me back. But since we have been very close. So he was PNC, you were NDC, yes. but he was PNDC, which is a party exactly. that birthed we were both, We were virtually both PNDC. Remind us again why he fell out of the rollings and left PNDC. Well, um, you know, Ndebore was forthright, and he had a strong conviction. In 1985-86, the PNDC were drifting towards the structural adjustment program. The IMF issues. The IMF issues, he and no we way. think that... Uh, they, we are wasting our time and that uh, we should try to grow our own economy and then uh, we should be self-reliant and the rest of them. So I remember one time Roland described me as a straight jacketed socialist, straight jacketed socialist. And uh, so because of the, some of these activities that were departing from the revolutionary norms and tenets, he left. They, 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 they had a bad relationship and then he left. He suffered arrest several times as a result of that. I think the last straw that broke the camera's back was in 1991, December 1991, 
when we had the Seman Peak Festival in Boku, Rollins came there. When they were singing the national anthem, they would refused to get up. So Rollins ordered the security to arrest him and shave him. And he was detained in Boko, uh, Boko cells. And later on, the Boko now had to go and plead for his release. So from that time onwards, uh, their relationship was very frosty. And uh, so when they lifted the ban on political activity, uh, he decided to go back to the Hilal Imam. Join PM. Yes, but it is because of Dave Bukhara that I became the tribunal chairman for the three northern regions in 1983. Okay. He, as, uh, as I told you, because of our closeness, he told me that Pletus, the PNDC find it difficult to get lawyers to work for the revolution. And then any regional minister who got a lawyer to chair a tribunal chairman will be a feather in his cap. And I said, Debur, why? If there's anything I can do to let you succeed in your administration, I will do it. That is how I accepted to become a tribunal chairman for the sake of Ndebogri's uh, uh, administration. And he then was, He was a regional PNDC secretary. secretary. Remind us about that role, the kind of yes. things he did in the he region. He was upper east or upper region? He was in Nigeria at the wake of the revolution. His team recommended him to uh, Rawlings that Ndebogri was somebody who could, uh, who could advance the cause of the revolution. Because they have been made in Navasco, the team of the Union of Ghana Students Secretary General. So Chris Atim recommended him, and the Rollins sent a, a, an Air Force plane to Nigeria, and they brought in Debo Rebrak in 1982. Here. When he came, he was sent to Tamil as regional, PNDC regional secretary. Oh, wow. He started in the northern region. He was so abrasive. The day he got there, the Tamil market caught fire. You know, and then he was so abrasive that he was given the nickname Ndebugum. Uh, Ndebugum in the Dagbani or Kwesa means Nde the fireman. <laughs> Firebrand. Was, yes, that is how bad he was. After one year, he was transferred to Bolgatanga. So he was a revolutionary to a foot. To the foot. A revolutionary, I don't know whether to the fall or to the, to the zeal. You know, I say, that type of thing. So he was uh, sent to Bolgatanga. And uh, he was very compassionate and he was a statesman. He, he was, was under deputized, his, He was deputized by another friend of yours, Martin Amiru. Martin Amiru, yeah, he was in Deborah's deputy. Mm. Even who their hair was in Deborah's deputy in Tamale. Oh, yes. Okay. yes, at the time, yes. Okay. Please, yeah. Can see now. Okay, so um, this 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 is uh, just a, this is City TV. We are broadcasting live from the State House in Accra. It is the funeral of the late John Akparibu Ndebogri, former Zebila MP. He's known as that. He was also a lawyer, a very controversial one. I'll tell you about my last interview with him. We interviewed him a number of times. He's always been controversial. But we are speaking to someone who has known him very closely. Someone he has taken a seat from before. Who got it back? That's a Zebila member of parliament, Cletus Avoka, former leader of the House of Parliament. So when he went to Upper East, where some of the things? Was it Upper East or it was Upper Region? Upper Region at the time. It was West under, under his administration that the Upper West was carved out. And as he had. Yeah, 82, 82, uh, 83, actually. Yeah. And then uh, he says that when he looked at the file, the previous regional secretaries or ministers had disrecommended the creation of the Upper West region. But when he came there, he wrote a memo saying that if at the distance from Bulgaria to was such that they needed to have their own region there. And then that is why Rollins uh, accepted it. And then we should, uh, let me give you that, Rollins uh, had a lot of trust and faith in Debogri. So in many things that he told Debo, I mean, uh, Rollins, he accepted them. So under his uh, supervision, the Upper West region was created. That was created and then the, he continued to be there then the, we had the Boko crisis in 83 84 and the, at that time they really wanted somebody to move the agricultural process of the country so he discovered that Ndebogri was the fellow who could handle the Minister of Agriculture. So he was made Secretary for Agriculture? So he was uh, shooting from Bolgatanga, I mean, Upper East Region, to uh, the Minister of uh, Agriculture. So wait, he went to Agri before he went to Volta Region, because he was also Secretary for Agriculture? He didn't go to Volta Region. He didn't go to Volta no, Region. at all. Okay. He was always at Agri. He was, he was Agri. It's Martin who went to Volta, Volta Region. Region, yes. Mm. Uh, it was Agri that um, they started flirting with the IMF. And then you see that I uh, hear he used to say that they used to send American ambassador and army to come and talk to him. And he used to, uh, that he used to you know, sack them, you know. So they might have been reporting to Chairman Rowland that your, your secretary for agriculture is not falling in line about the structural program, about the IMEA program. So because of that, they started uh, their differences. And then I told you the, what happened in 91 in Boku. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting. He's been controversial as a lawyer. Yeah. He was also very controversial. Yeah, Nobody had a lot of humility. 
despite this abrasiveness. Because after being a, a Secretary of State, a Minister of State, when he fell apart with Rawlings, he came back and went to read law as a student, even though he was assaulting lawyers or he, he, he didn't like lawyers. He decided to, he, in fact, he was a taxi driver first. He went to do taxi driving. He had a private car, which he converted into a commercial vehicle. That was how he was earning a living. He was driving from Accra to Aflao every day. Accra, Aflao, and back. Accra, Aflao. That is how he was earning a living and then paying school fees for his children and his wife. He was a, he was a commercial by, I mean, a, by a car driver. Then from there, he decided to go and read law. And that is a mark of, a sign of humility. Go from minister to come to be driving a taxi. Did you remark that even till he died, he was driving himself from exactly. Zebila all the way to Obuase to, to uh, go to court? To Accra and what not. To go to On court. several occasions, I told him that given our age and then the, the challenge that we have, our reflexes were no more very good. So he should get a driver. He, didn't, he said he didn't trust anybody except himself. In fact, it's the same thing I've also had in, in a running battle. In fact, right. the last time he and I spoke before he died, his sons had come to visit me in the yes, office. Yes. And we called him and said, stop going to court. Yeah. And he said he would not stop. And he had an eye problem too. Yeah. You know, driving was always difficult. He came all the way to Obuasi. It was a big problem, but he was doing it. He's a stubborn guy. That's Isn't right, he? yes. And, but his, and his from, death itself was controversial. From, from school days up to the time they were PND secretary, I was... I mean, I was the fellow, one of the only fellows. If you do not mind, this is a live television program and you are in, it's, it's disrupting us. So if you don't mind, please, um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. So, yes. till, till death, um, he was... Uh, so close that I could influence him in, in, in some ways. If there was something they wanted to do and they couldn't reach him, I could, I could reach him and whatnot. I see. We had that relationship. So, so even though we parted away politically, we came back together in 2012. We and said, no, together. politics shouldn't divide us. We have an inherent and an inner uh, challenge for our own group. So therefore, we should rather work together as a team. And we came together. And uh, I'm very proud. I'm very happy that it was his last public appearance was at my rally. At your program, where he said that he's about to die. Exactly. That was uh, Monday, 2nd May. Monday, 2nd May, 2022. I, I invited him, he came to address a rally on the menace of armed robbery in the district. Then on Friday that he passed on. It was at that meeting that he, yeah, that he is 72, he was about to die, and uh, he, as he challenged people, he admonished people to behave properly because life was not uh, constant. He, as if he saw his death, only we didn't know. But we used to, he said it several times, but we used to dismiss it. Even though I think the inwardly he knew what was happening. Only in the book could see. Could could things like Thank you so much. So, uh, we've lost somebody. Uh, we have lost a very honest man. You can't believe that they doesn't have his own house in that car. He has no house in any part except Zebila. Wow. How many politicians don't have mansions in this area and whatnot? He was corrupt. He had a very strong faith. And uh, he was very truthful. And then the. Uh, he was unbending. But if you if you if you had intelligent he liked intelligent debate. If your argument were sound, he agreed with you. This was in the book. Thank you for speaking to us. That's the honorable Cletus Avoka, uh, for MP for Zebila. Um let me see if I can speak to the honorable Hudu Yaya. Um my name is Umaru Sanda, this is City TV. If I yes, please if I can just have you here. Um so the honorable uh Hudu Yaya was uh, a deputy to uh, the Honorable Ndebogri, when he was a uh, minister or secretary at the time for the Northern Region, when Jerry Rollins appointed him as a Northern Regional Secretary, he was flown back uh, from Nigeria and then made the secretary. You were his deputy. How did you get How that? I, I have been researching. Ndebogri <laughs> is like a father, so I know much about him. Okay. You, you, were, you were his deputy, and I'm told the first day he arrived, there was fire in Tamale, <laughs> and he became Ndebogri. Oh, yeah. Tell us what you remember of uh, yeah. John Ndebogri, the man you served as. As, as regional secretary. Yeah, John Ndebogri. John Ndebogri was um, appointed in the first week of February. John Ndebogri was appointed uh, the PNDC regional secretary, the first PNDC regional secretary. I think there about, I think about first week of February. I don't remember exactly, but it was surely within the first week because I was appointed the second week. And indeed, when he arrived, in fact, he had to be flown in because Tamale was burning. 
In the days of the PNDC, the early days of the PNDC, Tamale was hot fire. We had about six military units. We had the 6BN, we had the Airborne for, uh, the Air Force, we had the Airborne Force, we had the uh, uh, military police, we had the training center. So they were, I mean, Tamale was a place of soldiers. So when uh, it looked like discipline had broken down, any soldier who misbehaved in town, you, it was difficult to find out which unit he came from. So we woke up in the morning and the Tamale market was on fire. And at that time, it looked like it was something that was occurring in the region because it had happened in Takrade, it had happened in Kumase, and then Tamale. So sabotage, possibly. You suspected sabotage. <laughs> well, we, we, we could suspect that. You know, so Ndebure arrived, and when he arrived, it was not long, I was also appointed. So we went, we, we, we went to the market. I was a boy of Tamale, born and bred in Tamale. And my family, about half of the market, I would say, were people I was related to. And I myself had worked in markets with my father. My father had stores and he was a tailor. You know, I, I worked, you know, so I knew the psychology of the place. So I used to go to Ndebure. We met the market women. We met the business people in the market. And we were able to actually pour some cool water on the fire, you know, to cool it. Then, under the leadership of Ndebure, uh, we put together a team that worked with the elders of the town, including Alaji Maida, who I believe you can remember. Yeah, and they, they were the elders of the town, so we were able to contain things. But the fire didn't stop there. Ndebure will not go anywhere unless I was with him. And we're like twins. We're all lean, like from the world, from the Sahel. Skinny and long. <laughs> you do tall. I mean, I'm sure he's taller than you. He's taller than me, but, but I think about two inches. Okay. Yeah, I'm 6'2", six he's 6'4". Six wow. You know, so our first out-of-town visit was to Bali. Where he, Savannah region now. Yeah, Savannah region now. In fact, no, it was to Damangu. Okay. Uh -huh. and the Savannah regional capital. Yes. The former Bali chief had been made the paramount chief of the place, you know. Hey, the way Ndeburi spoke over there, really very, very fiery, you know, revolutionary speech, you know. I, I know, honestly, it was, you know, <laughs> and that was my baptism of fire, you know. And the chief knew me because he knew my parents. He had been lived in Tamale before, you know. So he was speaking Hausa to me, and I kept calming him down. I said, oh, my boss, does. he's only speaking the truth, and so So we were able to water things. Within a short time, he was able to make friends with all the traditional leaders and with all the Tamale chieftaincy or Northern Region chieftaincy problems. He was able to contain it. But one other thing is that he gave a very firm foundation to the revolution in Tamale. He was not, he didn't stay in Tamale long. He was in Tamale for six months and then I took over, you know. So he had to leave Tamale? No, he was a, a to upper, upper East, uh, upper region. At that time it was upper region. It was not yet divided. It was upper East and upper West. Together, put together, upper, upper region. And we still worked, you know, we still worked together. And since then, he's been like a senior brother to me. You know, one thing I, you know, I like about Ndeburi was he's very, very frank and very forthright. But at that time, age was also not on my side. I was also very, very, very intolerant. So sometimes we will be, we will really have a very <laughs> a heated argument. Heated argument. But at the end of the day, soon we all subscribe to the same philosophy, you know, philosophy. That's uh, this in uh, Marxism, you know, revolutionary science and so on. At the end of the day, we know that, look, we are looking for the truth. So there was nothing personal about it. He left the PNDC for you people. He said he didn't, it was not going to be part of it again. How, how did that come about? Well, uh, listen, I think it was more of personal differences between he and the leader of the revolution at that time. And, of course, age also was very important because one thing about leadership, you know, and well-development affairs, you know, experience also counts, you know. But when you are young, you know, you are not able to give patients a little bit, you know, a little bit of chance. But I will say that it was just personal, you know, personal difference between he, that's how I would stake it. But that didn't prevent you people from relating? To, uh, no, 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 no. I was, at, I was one of his invited dignitaries to his 70th birthday. There, he, I was there. I was. I was there. He still con he considered an enemy family. You know, he was part of my family. You know, in Tamale. We know. are a country that runs with politics. We are running a democracy. There are people who have said that in Debugri's kind of personality is what we need to keep our de democracy alive and development of this country. 
do you think we are raising people like in Debugri in our current generation? What can we do to get people like that? Because we are well, told he's incorruptible, he's a no-nonsense man and all of that. Well, the point is, we are, we, we, we are raising them. And when I say we are raising them, Ndeburi was not raised. The society raised him. So definitely, the society will raise the people. You know, I mean, uh, listen, uh, I subscribe to uh, philosophical science, you know, in the sense of very objective science, in the sense that uh, in, develop, you know, uh, in social development, there is always the thesis and antithesis, which is, you know, which is generated by contradictions. The contradictions will come up. It will not stay forever. You know, some other situation will come and counter that and also now turn into ashes out of which the new will arise so definitely the phoenix situation come again the phoenix bed thank you very much thank you so i believe in fact i will say that our history is very important because our children they will get up whether you teach them in school or not they will imbibe it it's in, it's in the people i have confidence you know looking at the kind of youth we are bringing when you interact with them you know you will see that yes they are quite knowledgeable but what we the elders need to do is also environment has a big impact on the development of the mind they will not read it in books only we also have to live it so leadership the kind of leadership we have is very 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 important because they learn in fact in uh, leadership they say that the people you are leading look at what you do not what you say they look at what you leadership by example by example is, is very very important and that is what i insist irrespective of which party you belong to blue green yellow there must be certain basic standards certain red lines we must not cross corruption is one we must not and we must not in any way make excuses for corruption god forbid you, you sound very passionate on this subject very well because that is what has brought me in politics. Principles is very, very important. And Ghana is a, a wonderful country. God has blessed this country. Do we still have those principles in public service today, you reckon? I will say that I, am, I think that there's, there's a lot of room that we have to improve on. There's a lot of room because I wouldn't say we are perfect. And I will say that we have crossed a number of red lines and we must come back, especially in public service. If you offer yourself to public service, you must be, you, you, you must be, uh, this and, uh, you must go by the strictest of rules. And we must not compromise that at all. If we compromise that, it has a lot of effect. For example, corruption. You are corrupt. The economy doesn't work. The doctor ends by his salary. He's not supposed to go and end in any other place if he's not a private doctor. What about somebody what about somebody who is brought in under critical situation his wife goes to the same market with you the corrupt person he's going to buy the ingredients the same as you the corrupt person who has got an end income how is he going to make it so he has to survive he has to look after the family he has to look after at the end of the day you see that public service is also affected you know that is how corruption and people don't see it and the consequence as a state what would the consequence of this corruption is it something we we will be able to deal with of course we can deal with it it's a human situation and we can deal with it we don't only live it to prayer we must also act what, we, what should be the action what do you want to start seeing what are the key things you want to see the example we must, the rules must be there the laws must be there we have laws yes and you know and we must set examples examples work a lot we must set examples we must set examples that that is in public service. if you read Luke and you he will tell you how they dealt with corruption even even, even a minister who traveled out was invited out you know and came back he had to be punished he lost his job he was, just even by invite you know invitation of somebody outside and so on he didn't they didn't have to audit him and see that look you took this money and earned income and so on no yes by that yeah and if you look at what is happening in malawi also is it malawi yeah malawi on the COVID money and so on, what the president is doing and if you look at what mangaful of tanzania what here we can do it so, so we, we have the examples that we can emulate. We can emulate, and Africa needs it. Like Nkrumah said, no one African country can make it unless we are together. Yes. 
Thank you. Hey, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's uh, the Honorable Alaji Hudu Yaya. Um, he was serving as Deputy Secretary of the PNDC. Uh, he was serving as PNDC Secretary to John Indebugri uh, in the northern region at the time. And also, uh, he was uh, a leader of the NDC, has been General Secretary of the uh, National Democratic Congress. Um, and he is also, yes, part of the people who know in the Bugri very well and uh, has been speaking to uh, him, uh, speaking to us about his life and all of that. Um, let me speak to a few more people who uh, knew Ndebugri uh, and worked with Ndebugri and know him very well. I believe if we are talking about people knowing you are from his region, you, are, you have been in parliament, you have been in public service, you know him very well. Tell us what you remember Ndebugri. Uh, John Ndebugri was in my school, Navasco. Yes, I met him in Navasco and he was two years ahead of me. I should rather say three years ahead of me. Was your senior? Yes, he was my senior. Then we met again in Kwame Nkrumah, the University of Science and Technology. Again, he was a senior whilst I was there. And then, of course, I and Indebugde, we crossed Perhaps again, when I was made the regional secretary of the Upper West Region. When it was created? It was created. I was the first. But you're from Upper East? No, no. You're I'm from, from, you're from Upper West? <laughs> <laughs> so, you were also, this is the same region at yes, the time. Yes, the region yes. was created and you uh, went there. Uh, yes. So, here and we are reading about your life, we know that, yes, we are letting others know the good that you have done. What differentiates you from me? What is your extra oil? Esther has fallen. Does that mean that the sky must be darkened? No. When one star falls, another must emerge. Whatever that we have heard, the admiration that we, we, we are now harboring in our and minds, they must not remain there. Whatever good thing that you have experienced from our dear father, you must let it out. So if you are his son and daddy has shown you so much love, go and be a good father to your children. If daddy paid your school fees, and because of that, you are a somebody in our nation. You to go and pay somebody's school fees. Whatever good that we have received from the hands of our dear father, now it must multiply through us. Honorable John Indebugri is gone. But he must not be forgotten. Let others see him in our lifestyles. We are praying that as Jesus himself told us, that unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, it will remain a single grain. But when it dies, it will multiply. We pray that the death of our dear father, Honorable John in Debugri, will make many more good politicians, family men, state men, rise up to the occasion so that we may have a lot of good people in our nation. We pray that the, the dear Lord God will forgive the sins of our dear Father, whatever mistakes that he might have committed. May the mercy of God cover him. May the Lord grant him a merciful judgment and accept him into that house which he has built where his hands with the resources that Honorable John in Debugri provided. And we pray that we may not think of the length of our life, but rather the quality that we can put in it. May the Lord bless and keep all of us. Amen. Amen. Shall we please rise and offer our prayers to God? My dear brothers and sisters, we are children of the Almighty God who listens to the prayers 
of those who gather in his name. After each of our intentions, the choir will lead us in responding thus. Let us pray thanking God for the life of our dear father, Honorable John in the Green. God gave him to us as a gift, as a husband, as a father, as a friend, as a statesman. Let us thank God for all that he was able to do through him. For the help that he gave us. For the assistance, support, the shoulder that he gave us as a nation, let us thank God for the life of this great man. As it has pleased the Lord God to call him to himself, let us pray that the Lord will have mercy upon his soul and that he will grant him perfect rest in his very presence. For the soul of our dear Father, we pray to the Lord. We pray for God's consolation for the bereaved family the Ndebogri and allied families. We pray most especially for strength for the widow, Mrs. Sophia Ndebogri, that the Lord will endow his Holy Spirit upon her. The vacuum which has been created in her heart is that huge. No man can feel. It's only God who can do this. Pray that the Lord will forever be present in the life of Sophia and the children. Continue to pray that the death of our dear father will not bring division, not bring conflict and trouble in the family. Pray that his death will rather be a unifying force for Pray that the pain that they feel, the sorrow that has hijacked them, the darkness that has clouded over their family will be dispelled by the light of God himself. For the bereaved family, we pray to the Lord. Let us pray for our nation, Ghana. Let us pray for our president, I, cabinet ministers, all parliamentarians, all those who are leaders in our nation, that God's grace and strength and wisdom be bestowed upon them, that God will support them in all the policies that they are making, that the Lord God will make their reign beautiful that we citizens of Ghana may support the work of their hands, that we ourselves will endure all forms of laziness and apathy and put our hands to the plow so that we, together, will move the nation forward. Let us 
Let us pray against any wind of negativity that blows over our nation. Let us pray that the Lord God will cover every length and breadth of our nation with his wings. Let us pray that the Lord God will allow us to enjoy the peace that he wills for us. Pray for yourself that the Lord should let us realize the shortness of our lives and that we should live lives worthy of his calling. Pray that we may eschew all forms of foolishness as we live our lives and that we may live wise lives. That on the day that the Lord God comes calling, we will not tremble in responding. For these we pray to the Lord. Almighty and ever living God, we thank and bless you. We are those you will be glorified for your greatness. Lord, we appreciate all that you have done for us. We pray that all the intentions that you have put before you, that our dear Father will rest in peace in your bosom, that you will console the bereaved family, especially Mama Sophia and the children, and that you, O oh Lord, will bless our nation and also us. You will listen to us and grant us favorable answers. We ask all these through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Beloved in Christ, let us all kindly sit. It is now time to bring our offer tree to the Lord. Just to please situate the collection boxes, and they would invite the Christ the King Choir to lead us in a medley of songs.
Debogri uh, happening at the State House, the forecourt of the State House in Accra. And uh, we've been speaking to people who know him uh, from a working relationship, uh, people who have worked with him in Parliament, people who have engaged him when he was Secretary for the PNDC in the Northern Region, in the Upper East Region and Upper Region and so on. Beloved in Christ, shall we all please stand as we invite the parish priest to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. With longing for the coming of God's kingdom, let us offer our prayer to the Father as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. Grant our country peace and unity in accordance with your will. Grant our families peace and unity in accordance with your will, who we'll live and reign forever and ever. Let us kindly sit. I would like to invite our sister and daughter of our father, Patience in Debo Gree, to please come and read the biography of Honorable John in Debo Gree. Patience in Debo Gree. Thank you. Biography of the late Honorable John Aquarabo in Debugri, Esquire. March 12, 1950, saw the birth of a child to poor peasant farmers in Debugri, Azaxi, and Atumpako, Akorubila, Optimonde, and Bogori, respectively located today in the Boku West District of the Upper East Region. 
He was named a parable in Debugri, and later John as a Christian Catholic. For his primary education, John Aquaribo in Debugri, J-A-N, attended Tanga Primary School from January 1959 to July 1964. He then continued to Zebula Middle Boarding School from 1964 to 1965. Such was his intelligence that he took the common entrance examination in year one instead of the final middle school year in year four. Not surprisingly, in exceptionally, Congo Secondary, Ghana Secondary School, Tamale, and Notre Dame Minor Seminary. In Decho's Navrongo Secondary School for his secondary education, he was very enthusiastic in the sciences emerged in physics, chemistry, and mathematics. His secondary education was from 1965 to 1970. He took the ordinary level certificate examination and passed with great distinction, setting a record in Navrongo Secondary School as the first student to secure a distinction with five A's. In 1969, while on vacation at Zibila, Ndebugro was present at the annual students' get-together. Here, he met for the first time a young lady, Sophia, whom he will eventually call to become his wife and mother of all four of his children. For his sixth form advanced level education, in their return to Navrongo Secondary School in October 1970. Unfortunately, in March 1971, Ndebugro was dismissed from leading a student protest to confront maladministration by the school's authorities. Together with six other compatriots, Dismissed and had their names published in the Daily Graphic newspaper, ostensibly to prevent them from gaining admission into other schools. Notwithstanding the dismissal, his test for scholarship was not to be quenched. Debu Gray went to the then University College of Cape Coast to pursue a course in preliminary science, an equivalent of advanced level certificate A level. While pursuing this course, he studied privately and registered to write to the A level as a he once again excelled exceptionally and was admitted into the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, KNUST, where he pursued a program in chemical engineering from 1973 to 1977. While there, he was elected unopposed as the National Secretary of the National Union of Ghana Students, NUCS, capacity from 1975 to 1976. And they graduated with a B.S. in Horns in Chemical Engineering from KNUST. After his university education from KNUST, and they eager to give back to society the knowledge he acquired in his academic pursuit, took up a voluntary teaching job opportunity at Boku Secondary School from September 1977 until November 1977. Sometime in November 1977, he was at the Holding Corporation, Gihok until August 1978. Soon after his, he was recruited as a research assistant by the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research Institute, CSIR, from September 1978 until October 1978. Ndebure sought to challenge himself in the world of science. He was offered a, a position as a chemical engineer at the Gihok Glass Manufacturing Company at Aboso in the Western region. He maintained this position from October 1978 until April 1981. While at Abolso, in love to impart, to impart his knowledge and experience was ever present. He took up a part-time role as a sit form teacher of mathematics and physics at St. Gregoire Secondary School from January 1979 until April 1981. In May 1981, Debugra was recruited as a contract mathematics teacher by the government of the Cross River State of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and was posted to Goriti Girls Secondary School, Ekoti Ekene, where he taught mathematics until February 1982. After the coup d'etat of 1981, which overthrew the third Republican government of Dr. Hila Liman, Debugra was invited by leaders of the new regime to come back home to Ghana to assist in rebuilding our country and restoring probity, justice, 
accountability, and ensuring proper nation building. Ndebure accepted the invitation and was immediately appointed by Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings, who is late as the PNDC Secretary for the Northern Region in February 1982. Ndebure remained there until July 1982, when he was reassigned and appointed as Secretary to the then Upper Region, now Upper East and Upper West separated. Through his efforts and coordination, Upper West Region was carved out of the Upper Region. In May 1983, to create the Upper East and Upper West regions we respectively have today. And they remain PNDC Secretary for Upper East Region for, for until April, February 1984, when he was again reassigned to Accra as PNDC Secretary for Agriculture. Later in that same year, in November, he was reassigned as the PNDC Secretary in charge of the cocoa sector from November 1984 to October 1985, when he reassigned his position. Having parted ways with the PNDC on several irreconcilable differences, particularly on the creeping departures of revolutionary ideology, in Debrugre re returned to life as an ordinary civilian. He quickly applied to the law faculty and wrote the entrance examination. And they was first among the eight chosen applicants out of several others. His humility was a much while studying law at the law faculty. And they converted his only vehicle, a Peugeot 504 caravan, to a commercial vehicle plying the Accra Aflawa routes. He balanced his newly accepted private citizen life role as a commercial cab driver, law student, husband, and father to three children at the time. So popular was the secretary, stroke minister now turned driver, that many market women would wait until his car was available before they embarked on their journey to Aflau. He demonstrated exceptional intelligence as a law student. He won the admiration of all professors, classmates, and seniors alike. And they was blessed with the gift of analytical thinking, which eventually made him a colossus in his, son, his own right in legal practice in Ghana. Within a year, between 1985 to 1986, Inde graduated from the law faculty and was admitted to the Ghana School of Law, Makwala, in 1986. While at the law school, together with other patriots of Ghana, who shared a common vision of restoring constitutional order, Inde became a member of a group called Kwame Nkrumah Revolutionary Guard, KNRG. His organizational skills were soon to earn him the role of national organizer of the KNRG. Soon, many of these splinter pro-democratic groups met to form a unified bloc for the sole purpose of mounting pressure on the Rawlings-led PNDC to restore Ghana to constitutional democratic governance. The Movement for Freedom and Justice, MFJ, was to be born in 1990. Ndebura was a founding member and one of the leaders. With great defiance to the authoritarian regime at the time, he, together with a few bold others, pushed the Rawlings led regime by courting support from majority to Ghanaians to return Ghana to a constitutional democracy. Like the life of any great politician, he, with the likes of Kwesi Pratt, Kwame Uyafi, Kwame Karikari, Akoto Ampao, Johnny Hansen, and few others, suffered and paid the price for their unrelenting unsurveillance to an authoritarian regime. And they was arrested and detained without charge in July 1987. His arrest derailed his pursuit to graduate and become a lawyer with a graduating class of 1988. In March 1988, the PNDC government yielded to local and international pressure by releasing him from detention. He continued his political push to restore democratic governance while studying to complete law school. Debugre finally graduated and was called to the bar in October 1989. By 1992, multi-party democracy was restored in Ghana following the referendum earlier that year. Debugre again became a founding member of the Liman-led People's National Convention, PNC, and later became its first national vice chairman. In 2004, he won the parliamentary seat and became the elected representative for the people of Zebila on the ticket of the People's National Convention, PNC. Albeit for four years, and this contribution as a legislator in those four years was palpably visible for all to appreciate. 
While in parliament, he was a member of parliament judiciary committee, later became its vice chairman and ultimately its chairman. He was also a member of parliament select committee on constitutional, legal and parliamentary affairs, as well as member of the select committee on lands and forestry. During his tenure as MP, Honorable John Aquarbo in Dubuguri was also appointed as a member of the board of directors of Ghana Post Company. Ndebure continued to practice law and played an active role in national politics every step of the way. Often mischaracterized as a paria in his involvement in any political group, Ndebure was too feared, too principled, too uncompromising, too unpredictable, too independent in his thoughts to be influenced by party or majority view for the convenience of a few. These attributes often stoke doubts in the minds of many of his compatriots and political leaders from both sides of the political divide to engage and tap into his knowledge whenever they wielded power. And they was acutely aware of his misperception but was naturally unperturbed. He would not spend a second to change his true nature and character. He was too honest to a fault, too simple and modest to be greedy and corrupt too notorious for his intransigence on where his conviction directed him, too fearless to succumb to threats of possible retribution. Inde did what Inde wanted to do at all times. As he got older, Inde gradually relocated to set up the base of his legal practice in the Upper East region. He loved family, kinship, and preferred to spend his older years close to home and his people. Like old wine, he got better with age. He became less boisterous and confrontational, but remained resolute in his unrepentant penchant for honesty, justice, and putting country first. As was always his wish, he did not cause stress to others. He often said, I quote, you people will wake up one day and I'll be no more. Your maker heard you loudly and clearly and granted your wish on that fateful day. You will be truly missed but never forgotten. If man is truly remembered for his deeds while on earth, we cannot look past you. Your deeds will forever remain and guide us. Palm so winam na martin tifu. Rest well, a parable. Thank you. Please, we'll be taking some few announcements. From here, all those going with the family to Zebila, the bus is ready. If your name was not written, we would indulge you not to go near the bus. We will plead with you. Names have been written, and those names that have been written, they know themselves. So after the close of the mass, we are pleading with you you go to the bus, get yourself prepared so that the bus can take off. Tomorrow, John Aquarbo in Debo's remain will be flown back to Zebila. And he will be laid in state in his hometown, Timonde. Then on Saturday, the 16th of July, 2022, there will be a burial service for him, a burial mass for him. And burial service at his home, Timonde. His burial will be private, so all must take notes. Thank you very much. God bless you all for coming. That is a life well lived. We thank you very much, patience for leading us through the life of your father. As an add-up to the announcement, we have the contribution table, the donation table, just to my right. Please, you can approach them and give the donation you want to give for the family. At this moment, we'll be preparing for the final commendation. I would invite the choir to sing, when peace like a river, when peace, like a river while we prepare for the final commendation.
identity, but he didn't say that publicly. And this is something he said to me in confidence. Now that he's not around, I'm sure I can say it. The General Minister for Interior has known in Dembogri from childhood. You're welcome to City TV's cafe. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, you remember of your brother? Well, my elder brother, I first got to know him when I was in Form 1, Navrongo Secondary School, and he was in Lower 6. Before his arrival to the sixth form, we had celebrated his results because he had set a record in having five ones. The first time I was in secondary school in the GEC uh, O-level in 1970. So he arrived in the school as a hero. I was blessed to be in the same dormitory with his mate, Cletus Avoka. So he used to come there and he loved me. He carried me on his shoulder at least twice and continued to be on his shoulder. Yeah, and continued to be a good I think you come down, yes. Continued to be a good friend of mine. But unfortunately our relation was short lived because he led a strike when I was in Form One. His charisma gripped all of us. He led us to go on strike and boycott classes for things that he thought were not going on well. And in the end, a number of them was, were dismissed, and he was one of them who was dismissed. So I missed his company for some time. Then resurfaced when I got to the university. I met him again. By that time, he was already actively in politics with the PNDC. He came to uh, Borga as the regional secretary. When I left the university and I was a young lawyer, he tried to get me to join to help the NDC on the public tribunal and number of places and I turned him down. So although we didn't agree politically, he still was warm and he stood up for many things. Honest, straightforward, very independent minded. Even though we didn't agree, even when you didn't agree with him, you had to admire the logic in what he was saying. You only hope that it was only logical, but and so I used to tell him sometimes, you are logical, but you are engaging in sophistry. All in all, exceptional character. Then subsequently he became a lawyer. And when we met one day, he said, "Small boy, come." I said, "Senior, we are now mates." He said, "What do you mean?" <laughs> I said, "I was your small boy in school. Then you became a graduate before me, but I became a lawyer before you, and so I'm senior to you in law." And you are senior to me in life, so we are made, so we joked about it. But from there, we still kept, and I kept observing him, independent-minded. Uh, for whatever you think of him, I'm not aware of. He telling you in the end he was NDC. I knew he was MPP. That was the last thing he told me. That was the public information. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, but we've lost a great one. We've lost a politician. We've lost an orator. We've lost. A man who stood up for whatever he believed, I think that we all should believe in something. And he believed and stood up. And therefore you saw that principles sent him away from associates. First with President Rollins went away from him when he thought he wasn't doing what he was happy with. Came back and joined the movement that led fought for uh, civilian rule and multi-party democracy with colleagues like the late Adubu Ahin and of course the president was also part of all that movement he came as PNC subsequently as as uh, MPP he was a man he was a man he's a man we greet to borrow from Shakespeare when comes such another thank you so much the words of the honorable minister for the interior Ambrose Derry there and I can say that he is the one ending our coverage for us here uh, from the state house in uh, Accra, where the late Honorable John Akbaribun Debugri's funeral is being held, and he is going to be the body is going to be conveyed to Zebila in the Upper East region, where he will be laid to rest in his home region, his hometown. He has come to Accra and served the nation so well, and Ghana. I celebrated him for the wonderful and brilliant contributions he has made to the land. It is for that reason that he has the sitting president of the land, the former president of the land, ministers of state, members of parliament, the chief justice, all converging on one ground 
and celebrating the life of a man who has lived his life so well, a man who has been described as incorruptible, a man who many have agreed, indeed from across political divides, that he is a character worthy of emulating. This brings the curtains down on our coverage here. My name is Umaru Sandamadu. I was doing this with Duke Mensah Poko, broadcasting live here at the forecourt of the State House in Accra. Me, John Akparebo Ndebogri, the longest lawyer in terms of height, rest well. To our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant. To comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ, and now with you and with our brother forever. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us take our brother to his place.
welcome to the This Is Ghana Exhibition. It's time to show off the ingenuity, the innovation and the brilliance of made in Ghana products and services with the This Is Ghana Exhibition 2022. For two incredible days on the 27th and the 28th of August 2022, CCTV and CTFM will allow you to experience the creativity of authentic Ghanaian products in the biggest trade fair and exhibition for local SMEs, startups, research and manufacturing industries, homegrown businesses and indigenous corporate bodies Ghana has ever seen. We shall promote, support and patronize various Ghanaian products, solutions and services that are redefining the views on indigenous products and their packaging across all sectors in the This Is Ghana exhibition happening at the forecourt of the Accra Metropolitan Assembly AMA at 10 a.m. through to 5 p.m. each day on the 27th and the 28th of August 2022. Do you have that perfect solution or product proudly made in Ghana? Call us now on 0205-973-973 to showcase your made in Ghana product to the world. This is Ghana Exhibition is powered by City TV and City FM. I'm made in Ghana. This is the City Countdown number 10.